Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's My Games Recruitment Show, where, as you can see, we're going to be talking about how to win and deliver retained search because it is very different to contingent and exclusive. Now, we have two very special guests um, today, and Mike is going to introduce them. But before that, we do have to say hi to Michael. How are you doing today, big guy? Yeah, I'm OK, actually. I'm good. I've just put a little bit of treatment in my hair because people were just taking... Well, just take things with care to me, but I feel much better now. It's a story, isn't it, Lovey? It's an absolute it's an absolute story. It's a story. Okay. Well, before I introduce the guys, let me just say well, I think this is important because I think some people, rightly or wrongly, think that search is sort of like contingent plus or hmm. exclusive plus, and it just isn't. And you can get yourself into all sorts of difficulties selling it, but more importantly, delivering it um, if you don't fully understand what's involved in a search project. And I wanted, this has been spurred by one of our clients actually, who's been doing some search work for the first time and got it in, into some difficulties, quite frankly. <clears throat> and I'm not a search expert, which is why I've got these guys on. But when I saw what he was doing, it's like, well, that ain't right. You know, that's not, that's not how it should be. So rather than just make this stuff up as I go along, which of course I normally do, obviously, I thought I'd invite a couple of people on. So we've got Ward Hampton. Hello, Ward. Welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Good afternoon. And Ward is the founder and CEO of Ward, a search firm. And you operate on senior appointments in the data center space. That's correct, isn't it, Ward? That's right. Yep. OK. And we have the Cornish Indian, otherwise known as Lee Souza. There he is. Look. <laughs> Oh, bless his cotton socks. And and he uh, is CEO and, uh, sorry, founder and MD of Harrison Bridge. You operate in clean tech and the energy markets, Lee. I do. Hello, Mike. Hello, Kirsty. Great to be on the show with Ward. Yeah, we're looking forward to, to getting some stuff going on here, really. So before we kind of, Kirsty's going to dive in and start asking questions and things. But before we do that, I just want to say we're going to split the show into two, really. We're going to focus half of it on delivery. So what, what does it what does a search project really mean? And then the other half is how you sell it. So we're going to be talking about those two things. So over to you then, Kirsty. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to start it in a second with that kind of how it's different to contingent. But before then, two things. Number one, I want to say um, as we go through, if you have any questions, if you have any queries, pushback, anything like that, just pop those questions in the chat and I'll bring them up to our panel today. Oh, we've got a panel today. It's exciting, isn't it? Um, and um, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask them to answer that for us. So, Mike, should we get started by asking kind of what the process is or do you want to go on differences? No, let's uh, <clears throat> tell you what. I'll tell you what we'll do. Just a bit, a bit of context around it. I'm going to ask, uh, I'll ask Lee this time to come in first and just describe a little bit about his business and, and kind of his world. Just... Just a few minutes just to explain where, where you fit in things, if you don't mind. OK, um, if I perhaps give some context in terms of where some of the viewers might be. So I, I've got 20 years of recruitment experience, 15 executive recruitment. Um, and I went from I did a year at Hayes, four or five years in a boutique contingency recruitment where we were cold calling candidates. We thought we were doing headhunting. Um, and 2008 came, remember that recession, realized wasn't as good as I thought I was, then joined another executive recruitment firm, and I was like, yeah, I headhunt, told them my process, like, you're not doing headhunting, that's not how we do it here, and they were absolutely right, and, um, you know, what I thought was headhunting was cold calling candidates and saying, I've got this role, are you interested, that's not headhunting headhunting is getting candidates to sell themselves to you understanding their drivers and motivators without telling them anything about the job um and it's a court it's a case of wooing them over a period where once you get them in front of your clients there are eight nine ten out of ten are going to accept so i guess um that's kind of on the the delivery side so i, I joined an executive recruitment firm. I started in the research team. I got really good at headhunting, just headhunting all day long. Um, I then went into client management, which is managing a search end to end. 
and then I did the the kind of 360 work winning so you know the the search is split into kind of three stages you've got the research the upfront headhunting you've got managing the search end to end and then someone needs to win the work in terms of delivering a search I mean that can take 100 to 200 plus hours so well, there's we're a, a lot look of into that in some detail later I want you to I know I don't need to give away the, the family silver uh, Lee but I do want you to dig in on that a little later when we come to it because because I think that's where we're going to see the difference between recruitment and search, if you wouldn't mind doing that a little later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ward, can I just ask you to, you know, to give us a quick summary as well? Thank you for that, Lee. Good uh, good summary. And by the way, just before we go on, there's that thing of, I loved it. Yeah, yeah, I know how to do search. Do you? Let's have a look then. <laughs> no, you don't. I love that. Wish I could have been there for that. <laughs> good. Ward. Yep. So um, I've got... Uh, roughly 16 years experience in recruitment and search um, started out my career in a very different environment so uh, I was doing high volume temp trades and labor when I first started my career and then as I've gone through um, the last 16 years and when I've joined different companies I've steadily moved in the direction of working on perm vacancies working on more with more senior candidates and then that culminated in the last firm that I worked with we it was mainly a contingent recruitment firm but there were some people in that organization who were doing search uh, and I picked up a position um, delivered it via search um, with the help of one of the more experienced people within that business and just really saw the difference between the two and when I set up my business one or two years later, I really doubled down. And since then, for the last getting on towards five years now, um, we've been purely a, a retained search business. Now, thank you for that, Ward. A couple of things to say on top of that, just for context again. Then we're going to go into the detail. Um, yeah. Yeah. Two different approaches to search in front of you uh, in the two guys, because Ward... You live in Peru, I'm right in saying, and it's, mm -hmm. what, about 20 past six or something or wherever you are at the moment, something like that? Far too early, yep. yeah. Yeah, okay, far too early. Thanks. <laughs> <We're on it. laughs> Pushing that coffee down your neck. Um, and your team is all over the place. You have some in India, some in Europe, uh, some in North America now or soon to be, I think. So it's everywhere. It's a virtual team, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a virtual team. There's uh, just hired another guy actually a british guy who's going to be spending the majority of his time in colombia so he's going to be starting next month but yeah there's uh, a dozen of us now dotted around the globe and in the 10 or so years that i've serviced the industry that i do now um i've handled assignments in 16 countries and five continents so it's, yeah, it's so truly global what we do so two, two things for welcome to lead two things i want to draw out from that is you can run virtual uh search teams it's fine it works really well OK, so that that's the first thing. And again, you can be global. You can operate anywhere on the globe, which which would obviously do us now. By contrast, Lee's team is is all together in one place in the Midlands, UK. But again, you operate outside of the UK, I think, don't you do work? You don't just do work in in certainly the greater Midlands area, Lee. Agreed. I think um, just on that point, though, I think one thing that we find challenging is to take people from contingent to retained. And the pro they are so shocked at the difference, both from the delivery aspect and also the, the work winning aspect. So it does help to have people coming into the office at least three days a week so that you can do listening in sessions, do training is, is more easier, which is more difficult from home. Yeah, I, I, I know, well, know a little bit about your business, obviously. And both, both of these models work perfectly well they're approached differently. Ward tends to hire more experienced people who have come from the search end anyway. Whereas as you say, Lee, you, you've hired different people and trained them up. But I just wanted the viewers to realize you can have whatever model works for you, but you've got to really work at it. Okay, can I start with you, Lee? Could you just talk us through your process? So if I'm a client and I've said, well, okay, there's there's the deal, uh, off you go. Uh, mm -hmm. what, how, how would you, what would you do with that? How would you work that? What's the process you go through? So, I think that's where it can often go wrong because I think a lot of recruiters might spend five, 10 minutes on taking a job brief. So quite a lot of the time, 
hiring managers, and, and I'm talking about chief execs, haven't had any interview training, don't know what they're looking for. So we have quite a robust process around trying to understand what they're trying to achieve from a business perspective, what that means for the person, how we're then going to assess that person and creating criteria that we're going to assess candidates against. That can take 90 minutes where we are effectively interviewing them mm. against what they want uh, from a business perspective, the person, then we're considering their backgrounds, where we're going to find Before them. Before we move on to that though, just going back to that, because that's a really important point. I mean, do, do you push back then if if the chief exec or the MD or says, well, I want this, that, the other, or get a sit that you, you'll push back and say, well, let me just explore that a little bit. I'm not sure that's realistic. Is it a two way thing then? Yeah, because we, know the market better than they do and a lot of them have preconceived ideas around what's out there what they can get for their money and it might be that they think they can get an md for 150 but that's based on the current md that's not performing and actually mm. the rest of the market's paying 200 so you do need to challenge and if you are going to do executive recruitment you need to pitch yourself as their equal not be subservient and i think Sometimes it may be contingent recruit and executive recruitment. There's this imbalance, and you've got to be respected and pitch yourself as an equal. Do you, do you sometimes decide during that process that it actually I don't think I'll move forward with this project because I don't think I can work with this person? I mean, have you ever gone that far and then thought, oh, this isn't going to work out? Yeah, if they're completely unrealistic, if um, they have unquestionable morals and ethics sometimes to be honest you don't know that until you are halfway through the search and then it's like let's just get through this but i think what i would also then do is to let candidates know the sort of character that they're dealing with um you know i think most good headhunters aren't just thinking about the fee they're also thinking about their candidates because we are taking candidates out from usually where they're doing a great job happy where they are and the last thing you want to do is to take someone out of that into you know into the frying pan yeah ward can i bring you in on, on that so when you take a brief do you take a similar view to to lee uh, absolutely yeah we have a a briefing session and it's it's, it's important that all stakeholders that are going to be involved in the interview process uh, attend that briefing session as well, which as mm. Lee pointed out, that's generally 60 to 90 minutes. Um, and one of the reasons it's important they all attend is what you, sometimes happens if that if we don't do that is that you end up with different interviewers are assessing for something that's slightly different. So ensuring that everyone is fully aligned on that from the outset is of paramount importance. Um, and I definitely agree with everything Lee said there around being, uh, we're very selective on who we work with. I've worked, we've worked with less than 10 clients in the last five years. Um, and if I don't, it's, it's important to me and the team that we believe in the business that we're selling. Um, you know, I, and, and again, just echo what Lee said. Sometimes, unfortunately, you only find that out afterwards. Um, so there have been clients in the past where we've worked with them, we've put someone in there, and we, it's we, we've realised afterwards that it's not just not really a great place to work in terms of culture. And we've just made the decision that you know we're very niche. You know, we, we our our reputation is of paramount importance to us in this industry, mm. and we only want to be representing good good companies. Can I ask a question on that? And then I'm perhaps bound the same question to Lee as well. Do you think that being niche in the search world is important, whereas in recruitment, not so much? Do you think it's a it's a key deciding factor for search? I do. I, I personally do. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're incredibly niche in terms of the type of company that we work with. So um, it's all early stage, private equity backed companies that describe as startup or scale up data center developers. And there's, you know, there's not many of those. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I think in terms of certainly demonstrating uh, 
that you understand the market through the through the sales process. I, I just don't think you can do that unless unless you niche and you understand. <laughs> you, know, you, you wouldn't understand what this person's going to do within the organisation that's hiring, and then you understand who the target companies are going to be. Um, not just that, what kind of pain points people within those source companies might be feeling based on um, what you know about those types of organisations. So yeah, I. I I really do think that's that's very and, important. And you can speak the language, and as you say, you can understand more than just matching criteria off a off a screen that someone's given you. Lee, what do you think around that? Do you need to be niche, or can you just do it for any anything? Yes and no. So um, if I think back to two thousands, I you know was a niche recruiter in geotechnical engineering, which is ground engineering. And then um, 2008 recession happened, zero engineering construction recruitment going on in the UK. We had no market in the UK. So in energy and clean tech, we've got, I would say, probably several niches where we're very strong. Um, but we also pick up work in other areas where we don't necessarily have a lot of experience, but because of our kind of brand, being experts across energy and utilities, we can pick up work so we're less exposed. The, the problem with if you're very niche and you've only got a handful of clients is for any reason that there isn't a market, there's a downturn, you know, what, what are you then going to do? So a balance for you then really, a balance. Okay, well, so let, let's bring you in now. So you, you've taken the brief. During that period, you understand the role you, you understand the management team who were there in the room. You kind of got a handle on them. I presume as well that you've done some work around the company, the EVP of the company, to be able to represent the company as well. What comes next after that? Yeah, so look, we have we don't have just one solution. So we've got three different search plans, um, and they vary in terms of uh, cost and features and benefits that are contained within them and, and that enables the clients to choose the best the option that best suits them uh, enabling them to balance you know the cost of the search with the required breadth and depth of both but the they're, all retained, the right? they're all retained right yeah. All, yeah all all retained and you know they're all essentially based on best practice headhunting um so yeah once all of that stuff that you mentioned is 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 done and agreed then we essentially you know will cast a net over the entire talent pool um, that's been mapped out that that market map will be shared with the client in advance and that will be shared on a weekly basis to show all of our progress on the search um, and you know that will that map will we will have identified everyone who looks to have the right skill set and meets the criteria that okay. was taken Let's in the talk brief. about that for a minute then because we, we were talking off air that contingent recruitment is a race because mm. you might be professional and speak to candidates before you submit them to your clients, but other recruiters, perhaps not so much, and you lose out if you are last in with a candidate, even if you've done the job properly. Whereas in search, that doesn't apply because it's your deal. You're going to get the deal, right? So when you talk about market market mapping, is that quite an extensive uh, act, activity? How does that work? Yeah, so we've got a, an entire team of researchers based in India who will do the majority of the desktop based research and mapping for us. And then the consultants will be tapping into our network um, to look for referrals uh, in tandem with that. That's generally a two to three week process for us in order to fully map the market. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that can be anywhere between I don't know, 80 and 150 different people from uh, as a starting point and these are senior guys they're uh, they're not mid like junior management these are senior guys so to get that many is quite is quite something so i'll come back to you in a second so lee do you have a similar slightly different market so do you have a similar approach or do you di do we do it di differently it, it's more bespoke and it, it depends on the role um so I can think of one commercial director role that we worked on where there was probably only 20 competitors that we could headhunt from and we knew everyone. Um, so 
I got the retainer paid, the shortlist paid, and offer acceptance within four weeks on that one. Um, and then sometimes we work on roles we've never done it before. Um, so I can think of a chief digital officer role, um, and that took six weeks. So a lot of the research that we were doing was completely new. We had no candidates on our database. Um, and from taking the brief to shortlisting was six weeks. And I think mm -hmm. that a good search process, you can fill any role in any English speaking country first time round if you get the, the process right. And I think before this we started, both Ward and I, you know, we've both we've we basically fill every single role every single time. Not necessarily always first time, but if you have a very yeah. good process, it works. And and the secret to that process, it seems to me, is is how well you can penetrate or, or map the market is to be able to reach people. If you're not lucky enough to have a choice of, of 10 uh, pr prospects that you can go to, that would be nice. So, you know, it could it's be one of the secrets, Mike, because I think a lot of contingent recruiters um, hope for the best. Whereas what Ward and I will do is we're doing a lot of due diligence with candidates right in the beginning. We, mm -hmm. we are, you know, you're going to be all good candidates get counter offered. What will you do? We're understanding their drivers and motivators right at the beginning. We don't hope for the best. We, we've got a very good idea once it gets to offer stage what candidates are likely I, to do. I remember you came on the show before. That's just sparked a memory. You came on the show before and we talked about um, what about counter offers. And you don't get that many really that are successful. You came on the show to talk about how you did that in depth. Well worth it, actually, if you get a chance, guys, to skim back. Kirsty, you'll put the link to that one uh in in the uh in the comments but i'm still getting royalties um, from that show mike it's a bit yeah yeah obviously yeah, yeah. yeah in the post, in the post. We, uh, we pay weekly yeah uh, very weekly actually but um but i remember you said they've got to be serious they've got to be uh suitable and serious for the role and and i think that struck with me because whereas a lot of recruiters are just looking to assemble a short list that looks credible they can put forward i think search it's no they're almost looking for reasons why not to put somebody forward if somebody says or does something that's not, mm, no, I don't think we'll risk that, and out they go and make room for someone else. Do you think that's that's kind of have I sum, summed up your perception of search as opposed to to recruitment itself? Yeah, very much so. It's a different mindset completely. Whereas contingent, in general, is more transactional. Retained search is more consultative, and you're just constantly worrying, thinking about what can go wrong what are the red flags mitigating against that yeah and we, we've had a similar conversation before i know ward and, and you you take a similar view don't you you're looking for, almost looking for ways to expel people and what you've got left is a really good solid list yeah look we we run the search to completion before we shortlist so um at the end of the the process that we've run we'll shortlist the top three to five people within the market who've been um, assessed and benchmarked against each other and um, you know they will meet the criteria and have good motivations to, and, to be in the so process. During that process of qualification board, um, so, so you find someone, so your research team in India finds someone right and then it gets passed through to your uh, researchers who kind of outreach and filter for you um how many conversations do you think between you would you have with a candidate typically you know whereas with a recruitment it might just be one or maybe two would you have more than that for, for search it, it depends on the search plan that the client have uh, agreed um so um ultimately for our top tier search plan which we call the deep dive um we include um uh, psychometric testing within that we even bring in business psychologists to carry out psychological assessments um, on, on candidates. Um, at the front end, we'll agree the top two to three functional and behavioral competencies that the client are looking for, and then we'll craft uh, competency-based interview questions to, to test, test those. So you know, we could be having you know, up to three, four conversations with people before they're shortlisted. Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that the same for you, Lee? Yeah, it is. It's probably 
one to two calls with a researcher, you know, and I think what we'll call them, let's call them suspects, mm -hmm. you know, and then there's some interest that they, they've evidenced some ability, um, then their prospects. Um, and then, you know, when the, then the, the client manager is doing a in-depth interview competency base. And then again, depending on what the client wants, that may also include psychometric testing, perhaps after first interview. Okay. All right. Okay, guys, I, I know I could listen to you boys speak all day, but we've got a really good question. And then I do want to move on to kind of how we sell and stuff like this. But Emma has asked, I think, a really good question. She said, does the panel believe there is a market for a blended retained solution that takes the best of contingent and search in a mid market? So that's about £50,000 to £100,000. So, uh, Ward, I'm going to come to you first. So it depends what what they mean by that question um, in terms of blending it. But uh, one of the things that we do, which is different to, let's say, the big five search firms out there, um, is we will be more flexible in terms of how our payment schedule is structured. Um, so you know, the big five are very, um, it's a third, 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 and, and they don't tend to deviate from that. Um, whereas we will look for me the retainer is about getting commitment from the client knowing that we are the only firm they're working with and that enables us to put a much higher degree of time and attention and resource into the search so we'll we will i've got some clients where we'll just take the th a third up front and then the remaining two thirds on delivery but and, and you know we'll will work with the client to make it a bit easier for them from a risk point of view. But, but ultimately, it's retained or nothing. I mean, however yeah. you structure the payment. Yeah, OK. Lee, yeah. have you got, would you like to put a, put a few comments on Emma's question? I think the problem is that with blended it is you're neither one nor the other. And I, I think, you know, both Ward and I, it's just a categorical no to contingent. Um, and it, it might, you know, if you're going into a new market where you've got no experience of recruiting, I don't know, directors for data centers, you might do for the first year some contingent work to build your track record. But then over time, you might transition to do more retained. Um, but we completely draw the line at doing any contingent work. It's all 100% retained and we'll turn down anything that is contingent. Well, I, just before we move on, I know Kirsty's keen, but I'll just round this off. Thank you for that, guys. We're going to move on to the second stage now. Hope that was useful, Emma. What I would also say is this. In contingent, it is a race. There's no question. And um, because it's a race, you don't get the chance to do the job properly. You don't get to do a proper deep dive on their suitability and are they serious about the role because you've got to get the CV in real quick. Likewise, you don't get the breadth of search that you would normally do if you've got all the time in the world or within reason. So because of that race, you've got to just do what you can and move on because if you're only being paid for a fifth or a third of the things that you work on, you know, you work all week, but only get paid for Friday, then you can't really afford to spend a lot of time working one role forever. You've got to move on to the next one. Whereas in retained, you absolutely can. So I think it would be very difficult to merge retained and uh, and contingent unless you go down the exclusive route but then that's a whole different conversation that is a whole different conversation that we don't have time for right now so in a second i've seen another question come in which i really want to bring up in a second um but before then mike before we go on to how to sell retained as well i think it's about time for a message from our sponsor why yes <laughs> it is and that's us actually yeah. thank you good thing okay so um, we run Profit and Lifestyle Growth Summits. We run them online. We run them in person. This is time invested working on your business, not in your business. And it's really important to differentiate the two. The more you spend working on the business, the less you need to spend working in the business. So what we're looking at here is, is, is a whole day, if it's a, an in-person event, or if it's online, it's two, three-hour sessions. And we're going to look at strategic BD, how you win high value clients, not just chase around looking for vacancies. Apex Client Care is about making yourself the Apex uh, supplier. 
how do you really make the clients want to use you first ahead of the competition any kind of marketing you spend on money on has got my suspicions up straight away some of it's decent but mostly we recommend zero cost marketing uh, layered fulfillment is the opposite end of uh, 360 so if you don't want to use 360s because they're hard to find hard to keep and if they go they're going to take a revenue stream with them then uh, a layered fulfillment approach or blended is the way forward for you and lastly if you want to attract and keep the right people for you then you need to be a sticky employer so what we will do full day in Birmingham 197 quid that's all in including lunch breakfast Great. all the teas and coffees you can possibly consume <laughs> The alternative is an online session, which we do in the evenings. We do two evening ones. In fact, we've got one this evening and one tomorrow. They're sold out now. But um, we we've got slots available for our autumn fixtures. And if you are interested to learn more, then all you would need to do is email summit to mike at flare.co.uk, and I will send you a link. And then you can read all about it. And if you want, you can book your place. Indeed. Okay, right. So I, I do want to go on to how to sort of sell and pitch, but we've had a really good question from Ian that I want to just kind of get, I think you guys could give a, a fairly quicker answer on this one, which is, Ian said, I know these are senior roles, but from a candidate perspective, is there much pushback in regards to having so many touch points? You have three to four calls with them, then the candidate will have multiple interviews. Is this not overkill? So Lee, I'm coming to you first on this one. No. Um, and actually, <laughs> very succinct. <laughs> and actually, the feedback that we get from candidates is that they really appreciate the in-depth process that we know the role inside out. Um, and also, you know, what Ward and I will do, we spend so much time preparing them for interview. So I'll, we'll I'll spend thirty minutes preparing candidates for interview in terms of what questions they're likely to expect, how to answer competency-based questions, what the culture's like, the interview style, their disc profiles, et cetera. So, you know, we're kind of career coaching them, interview coaching them, um, that they just wouldn't get anywhere else and they don't get from contingent in general. Yeah, perfect, thank you. And Ward, your opinions on this one? Yeah, um, I'd, I'd agree with that. And um, look, it, it, in some ways making as long as they've got the right motivations at the front end, um, you understand what the push and pull factors are and the role meets that, then making the process more difficult for them or in, in some respects makes them often makes them want it more as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, look, there's many cases we've had in the past where that candidate, it's a senior, it's a senior individual when they go to, when they take on that role, they've seen the depth of process that we go through when we um, hire people. So they're much more likely to come to us when they need to build out their own team as well. I like that. I like that. Okay. So we have had a couple more questions. I will bring them up in a sec um, keep them coming if you do have any more. Uh, but Mike, should we start talking about kind of how we sell retain and how yeah. that's different to contingent? Yeah. I'd like obviously to get the guys input on this. Um, in many cases with contingent, you can get the role from a cold call where you you certainly could perhaps not so much now, um, but to, I always think when when you think about retain, the word project springs to mind. It's a project. And often search companies call it a project, whereas recruiters call it a vacancy or a role uh, or requirement. So uh, come to you first, Ward, if I can. What's your approach to pitching for this kind of chunky business that you're going to get from them? Yeah, so... We call it an assignment, so an assignment project. Um, uh, and yeah, I think I, th I think the, the the main thing is that you need to be able to convince that individual that you can successfully deliver the search. And, and at the end of the process, they're going to be hiring the best person from all of the talent that's available to them in the market at that time. Um, and Again, this is where I, I go back to, I think it's important to have a niche um, because you need to have a demonstrable track record within this space and be able to sh show what you've done in the past. Um, and as Lee said, one way of transitioning into retained is to make sure that you've, you know, maybe if you're going into a new market or a new space, then uh, you, you might need to get a track record of delivering on the contingent side first before making that, that transition. Just, just before I move on to Lee on this as well, just a further question. 
if I was uh, an MD or a CEO of a big company, I'd really want to know what search techniques or the mapping. How, would, how are you going to find these people? Because that's ultimately it, isn't it? The bulk of it is how you find people. Then you've got the qualification, obviously. I'd be interested to know how you make sure you get the right person for me. But I'd really be interested in, in, in your search and your mapping. Do, do you find that people are interested in that or is that just me? Oh, oh, sorry, I thought that was to Lee. Um, no, bring Lee in on that then as well. Uh, look, they, they are interested in knowing where these where we're going to find these candidates. And, and again, I'll touch on what I was saying before in terms of it. That's where it's important that you can demonstrate to that client at the front end. You know the companies where these people are going to be based. And not only that, you know some of the pain points that they're more likely to be feeling within a company like that. So, you know, for example, most of our clients are early stage startup, scale up type organizations. And we spend a lot of time taking people out of, you know, larger, uh, more mature organizations within this space. And often people who've been with those orgs for a while, the business might have been smaller when they joined and they're now starting to feel some of the pain points around bureaucracy and, you know, just, um, yeah, just, just the, um, corporate inertia that comes with you know a, a larger business so yeah okay Lee got any comments on that I just want to go back one step around I think we need to be careful about what language we use because no one wants to buy a project they don't give a shit about recruitment until they have a need they care about them and their problems and we've got to be careful not to pitch slap people and make assumptions on what we think they want and need. So, you know, a good question would be to ask if we were to work together, what three things would be most important to you? But, you know, again, the big mistake that contingent transactional recruiters make is sell, sell, sell right at the beginning. You don't sell at all until you've uncovered pain, you've qualified them, you've understand the decision making process you know, the urgency, the impact. Um, and then when you've done all of that is when you will sell. And I think one of your comments advertising the show was about how do we persuade, persuade people to buy a retained solution? You can't persuade anyone to do anything. They have to persuade themselves first, yeah. but you can help them realize that through great questions. A ka -ching moment. And do you find during that process, because I've, I've seen you in operation, actually, and you're very good at that. Do you find during that process that without perhaps coming across as being arrogant, because that's counterproductive, but you do kind of have to lead people a little bit because they don't understand the search process as much as you do. Do you find that you are leading people through the questions to where you want them to be? You certainly try to. Um this is the hardest aspect of executive recruitment winning the work winning new clients the delivery process is a lot easier um candidates and clients lie or prospects lie and i think that effective questioning is quite difficult and unless you go through that you you end up in what I call the buyer seller dance where they go quiet. You think you've got a search being signed off, and then all of a sudden, you never hear back from them again. So it's not easy. Are well, during this process, Lee? Are they are people looking for credibility as well? Proof that you've done it for somebody else like them, or proof that you've done, or do they just look into the into your Cornish Indian eyes and think? You're mine. I'll go with you. I trust him. What, what trust that's him. a great point, that is, Mike. So I've won searches where I've got zero experience um, because they've just liked the Cornish Indian brand and the stupid LinkedIn post <laughs> that I do. Um, but whenever someone asks you a question, you want to do what I call a, a reverse question. So I'm curious, you know, why is it that you ask that about that? Because quite often the question they ask you is not the real thing mm. that they're looking for, you know, and what does track record mean? And it might be a track record of filling niche roles, in which case you can give an example of something that was niche, but wasn't exactly the same. Mm. So we have to be very careful of making assumptions. And you, every time a prospect or client asks you for something, you don't answer it. You ask them great question. 
Any reason why you ask? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I I'd like to be the I other use it on my wife. <laughs> That's also so a good idea, know. I think. She could be watching this, you know, and then what? I don't know. Well, can I ask you the same question? Credibility. Do you do you think that's are they looking for credibility or like like with, with Lee, do they look into your baby blues and think, Ward, you're my man? Um I think they are looking for credibility because certainly at the more senior end, they want to have the confidence that you've got the credibility to talk to a CEO of a business on a peer-to-peer -peer level. Um, and often, you know, we, we spend quite a lot of time um, correcting misconceptions that the market might have about a particular organization. Um, so, you know, you, you, you need to understand the market that you're operating in, in in order to be able to correct any assumptions like that. Okay, thank you. Now, I've got a couple of questions and then I think we'll have to wind up, won't we, Kirsty? do. So in a second, I'm going to come to, to Lee and Ward for their top tips. You know, if you want to do retain, the thing that they think is, you know, the first thing that you should think of. But we've had some questions. So Abigail has asked, how does the panel adjust the delivery process or fee structure for interim appointments, if at all? And what has been the most successful to both sell and also deliver? So uh, I can't remember who I went to first. I'm going to go to Lee first this time. I can't remember who I went to first last time. But Lee, you first. Yeah, so um, I used to do, I led an exec interim practice for a previous company. Um, and I think one of the mistakes that I made was going in too high. If you look at the, the top end executive search, executive interim businesses, they're charging up to 25, maybe 30%. Um, and that's, you know, and there's margin and there's markup. Um, so I think for exec interim, you want to be charging 20 to 25 percent the delivery process would be perhaps maybe up to a week no longer that is on success only i i have actually sold a retainer um on exec interim but it, it's more difficult mm. but the, you know in, in rooms they might they want them asap one yeah. of the problems though with exec interim though sometimes is that it can be an idea and you can do a whole load of work and then they go, oh, we don't need it anymore. <laughs> right. OK. That sounds, yeah, sounds familiar. OK. And Ward, what about you? Uh, I can't really help on this one, I'm afraid, because we, we don't touch that space. It's it's all pure. Uh, Fair so. enough. OK, that's great. Thank you very much. And then we've got our final question here. And Ward, I'm coming to you first. Is would you class exclusive the same as retained? And this person is apologetic for mentioning exclusive. but. <laughs> Uh, no, I wouldn't. Um, and I, I wouldn't simply because I, I, I still remember my, my last uh, employed position. I had I had a, a client who I thought was great they were because I, I was looking at how much they were spending with us each year. And then I remember one of the first calls I made before I set up my business was I actually phoned Mitch Sullivan um, about something. And he was he was asking me, uh, how what percentage of roles that you were given on, on an exclusive basis um, ultimately turned into a placement and I hadn't actually audited that before and I went back and looked at it and it uh, I can't remember the exact number but this client that I thought was great it actually turned out they were giving me 50 60 percent of, of the roles they were giving me ultimately didn't go anywhere so we had them exclusively but they decided you know they weren't ultimately something changed within the business whereby they, they didn't ultimately go out and hire that person so um exclusive is a thousand times better than competitive contingent um but it's still too high risk for for us um in order to put the amount of time and resource we put into a search perfect thank you and lee you 100 percent agree you know i think if you're going to work contingent and even if exclusive, you should be asking 10, 15 minutes of qualifying questions. Mm -hmm. And recruiters don't, you know, and they've just got an idea. They have the role isn't signed off. They're not the decision maker. They've got no authority to recruit. You then spend a couple of days working on a role that's not signed off. Absolute madness. I, I so, think I would agree with both of those points. But what I've seen working for people who are moving towards the retained space or working with clients that they've only ever done um, contingent 
is it's exclusive so it's mine for six weeks there is a contract involved and the contract says if anybody comes in during that period and they're placed i get the money but you pay a deposit up front so they're actually committing some cash up front some the money comes to you but that gets paid back if you don't deliver a credible shortlist and i think lee said earlier well you know that's a bit dangerous and it is but as a step forward as you're moving towards a chain maybe that would help you perhaps Okay, that's actually really interesting, Mike, because the last question I'll bring up um, for what we've got time for is Ian has said, both of you have experience prior with retained search. So how would you advise leaders to introduce this in their business without having that experience prior? So that's Mike. That's your answer to it. Lee and Ward, do you have any advice on this, Lee? Yeah, so um, in a previous business that I worked in and the, the business, not me, I reckon hired 50 business development recruiters to sell search and I think less than 5% were successful. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the reasons for that were that they hired the wrong types of people that weren't hunters, um, who didn't have the right mindset, that, were, that saw themselves subservient to the client. Um, so there's a whole load of things there around their kind of behavior, their attitude and technique. Um, and I think what I've recently learned in the last few years is that, you know, I have won historically a lot of work with my personality, but you can't roll out personality because it's individual no. to you. So you need a common sales process and methodology and language around how you're going to sell it. Um, and in my experience, very few recruitment businesses contingent or retained have a documented sales process of how they're going to sell anything and exactly the same on delivery okay all right and ward do you have an answer to this um well look i i came from a contingent background and you know, i did have that support of someone within the last business um, that i was in which was helpful um but a, a lot of the process and procedure that I've put together, I've gone out there and you know found out how to do it myself. I've taken ideas from podcasts. I've got some external training myself, um, and so I, I do think you. I don't think you have to come from a search background or have worked in a search business in order to be able to deliver search, um, but you do need to make sure you've got that robust process and procedure in place before you go out and start trying to win these types of assignments. That's a really good point, actually. And, um, you know, previous businesses have hired people from big corporate executive recruitment firms mm. who rely on their brands. They go and then work for a boutique and, you know, they don't cold call. They don't even headhunt candidates. They just send LinkedIn messages. So, um, you know, there's a whole range of issues and challenges around where you hire people on that suffice to say that there's more to retain than the terms and conditions of payment yeah okay yeah i think a lot more yeah. to it and that's the point of, of doing this today okay kirsty okay yeah so we've run out of time unfortunately um but i do want to come and kind of top tips so People are thinking about retain. They're thinking about either moving more of their business there or, or they want to start doing it. So Ward, your top tip for this when we spoke about it before was this, have a differentiation between contingent and retain. So do you want to explain a little bit more on that? Yeah, so um, I I quite often get recruiters contact me on LinkedIn and ask for a chat and I'm happy to do that. And one of the things they say is, oh, I've, I, don't, I don't think it works. It, retained works in my market. I've tried it, but then ultimately I'll, they, they, they won't buy it. So I'll then take on roles on a contingent basis. Um, so for me, one of the things that I just took a flag, planted a flag in the ground when I started my business, I was like, I'm not going to take on any contingent work. Um, it, it did take me a lot longer than I hoped to win that first uh, search, but um, there was definitely, I get work from clients who maybe aren't used to search, um, are used to contingent, and I'll, I'll walk away from them initially. And quite often, when their pain gets a bit, uh, a bit higher, then they'll they will come back come back to us. But it's it is incredibly important that you have a real differentiation between what retained is and what uh, contingent is. 
Perfect. Thank you very much for that. I like that. And Lee, your top tip when we spoke about it was you can't learn to ride a bike from a seminar. So if you, you want to delve into I want to change it now. I want to change it. I was I wanted to build on what uh, Ward just said. I think oh, yeah. where there is pain, there is gold. Um, but I will answer that one, Kirsty, so you can bring it back up. Okay. So I, a few weeks ago, got an email from one of the recruitment trade bodies where how you can learn to sell retain search on a half day course for 500 quid. You, it's not happening. You can't learn how to sell retain search in half a day. And I think there's a lot of recruitment trainers out there that do training on candidate management, client control, how to sell retain search. And I wonder how many times they've sold retain search or whether they've been trained in consultative solution selling. So retain search is a solution selling process and it's very different to contingent recruitment. So that to sell it effectively, you need to have training, you need to have coaching, you need someone listening into your calls. That's not going to happen on a half day course, Kirsty. I mean, unlikely, isn't it, Lee? It is very unlikely. Okay, thank you very much all. So before we go, let's talk about our next show, which is our final show before our summer break, where we have a very, very exciting uh, guest, Benjamin Mina. We do, Benjamin Mina. He's um, a big podcast host in the States. Very good podcast, actually. And he's got his finger on the pulse of what's happening in America in terms of the rep world. And I always like to think if you're in charge of a business, one of the things that you should always do is understand what other people are doing. It may be relevant to you or it may not. You may be able to absorb that into your business or you may not. But I think to know what the Americans are doing and how they see the world, uh, particularly around things like AI, um, I think is going to be really, really useful. So he's coming on board. He's going to be sharing tips and techniques. And just uh, bringing his crystal ball as well, I think, with him. So really looking forward to that one. Last show of the season. Very, very excited about that. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for everybody watching and all of the questions asked. We so love it when you get involved and ask us questions. It's always it's always fun for us. And I want to say a huge thank you to both of our guests, Ward Hampton and Lee D'Souza. You have been absolutely fantastic today. So thank you very much. As we do, Lady Yes, I was calling you new. And of course, I should say thank you to Mike, shouldn't I, Mike? Don't bother. You don't mean it. I know you don't mean it, so don't bother. No. It was your birthday yesterday. I'm going to give you a gift of saying this to Okay, you. yeah, yeah. Okay, looking forward to that. Okay, okay guys. No, thank you very much for appearing. And, and a big thank you for Kirsty for managing her show in the in the style that she does. I really appreciate that. Okay. And we'll see you uh, in two weeks' time. You will indeed.